Hey everybody, today we're going to implement a simple top-down game camera system in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. As you see here, I have a character on the screen, and if I press the arrow keys, the character will move and also be followed by the camera, kind of giving the illusion of a Game Boy screen or something like that. Uh, let's see, additionally, if I kind of walk into the walls here or the edge of the map, the character will stop moving. And then as a bonus, we have these clickable arrows down here. If I click the arrows and hold them down, it will do the same thing as the um, keyboard. Now I'm saying camera, but camera is kind of a fancy pinkies up way of describing what's really going on here. It's really just a simple visual trick, and we'll walk through that today. So as always, I've prepared a code pen for us here today. It's almost exactly what we just saw, but a little bit more minimal. And let's just talk through the elements real quick. The core concept of what we'll be covering uh, really just revolve around three elements. We've got a camera, a map plane, and inside the map plane we have characters. To get a better look at what's going on here, I'm going to pop open the inspector and just show you. Let's start at the top level here. We have a div with the class name of camera on it. It may sound backwards, but this camera is not going to move. It's just a fixed size rectangle. It's going to stay right there in the middle of the screen. Uh, which seems backwards because usually when we say the word camera, we think of like camera following something around. Um, this camera is really just the frame of what's going on in the game. It's just going to stay right there. Uh, right inside the camera, we have this map div. When I inspect the map here, you can see that the blue inspection lines actually go beyond the bounds of the camera. That's because the camera is only showing a subset of the map. What's going to happen is when we move the character, uh, the character is going to get a new spot in the map. We'll cover that in a second. But then also we're going to move the entire map plane opposite of what the character just moved. And that's going to give us this illusion that while the camera is actually not moving, it's going to feel like the frame of what you can see is moving. Our last piece here are characters. And characters just live inside that map layer. Whenever the characters move, they get a new position relative to the top left corner of the map. Now let's talk through some of the CSS that's happening here. At the root level, we have some variables established. Uh, the first is pixel size. And I've covered this in previous videos, but if you haven't seen those or you don't remember, the pixel size is the dis actual display size of each individual pixel on screen. Every asset you see here is designed at a natural one by one pixel size, which means that the final results are very small PNGs. Uh, but because we have this cool CSS rule, image rendering pixelated, we can actually take a small image and scale it larger to what its natural size is, which is normally a no-no with images because they get blurry and gross. Uh, but with pixel art, pixel art is always designed in really even squares of color. And so if you're multiplying it up evenly, you can get away with this, which is nice because then your assets stay really small. So pixel size is going to keep track of that, which also means that because it's a CSS variable, we can change it with media queries and in all kinds of different ways. So if I open up the window here to give us more real estate, the pixels know to snap to a larger size. Scrolling down here a bit, we've got the camera. Like we said, the camera is a fixed size. It never moves. And then the, the key to the whole trick is going to lie in this CSS um, rule right here, overflow hidden. We'll play with that in a second. Uh, we've got background camera. That's all just decorative stuff. Our map down here loads in the image that we're using. So say you're going to change the level, you need to change the image that's being loaded into the map here. And then along with the CSS rules, um, like I said, I don't know if we covered it, but grid cell, that's a different variable we have up here, which is the natural pixel size times 16. And so the grid cell size just gives us this an easy multiplier. This map was designed at 13 uh, cells wide, 10 cells high. And so we can set the width accordingly. And then just some basic CSS for the characters, including how big they are and um, that they're absolutely positioned. Things, again, that we've covered in previous videos. So if you missed those, definitely go check them out. Now let's jump into some JavaScript, which is going to allow us to start moving things around on interaction. First thing we're going to do, just so we have it around conveniently, we're going to grab a reference to the character element. So just document.query selector. It's going to give us back that div that is the character. And then same for the map. That'll be used a lot in a little bit. And then we'll set up some basic variables of state. Right now, this is a really simplistic example. So a real game, you'd probably have state of multiple characters. And it, it would be a lot more fleshed out than this. But this is all about that camera concept. 
So we have an X and Y, and this is for the player. And then we have um, held directions, which is how we're going to implement keeping track of which arrow keys are held down right now. Then we have our speed, and speed is just a config item on the character. Uh, it's going to tell us when the character's moving, how many pixels per frame do they move. Normally in a real project, you kind of introduce an element of ch delta, which is like how many frames have passed in the current second, so that you can kind of match the actual speed to real time in seconds and not be married to frame rate, because frame rate can vary on different computers. But for our simplistic example, this is going to be fine. Now let's talk through kind of the meatiest function that we'll deal with here, and that I've called it place character. What it's going to do is uh, determine if the player is holding any actions down, and then uh, based on that, reposition the character into the map where they should be. Uh, and so what we do to start is, again, we really bank on this idea of pixel size. Because we're changing that in a responsive game, um, we always need to have that factor around. And so what I've done here is just pull it from um, the CSS using JavaScript. And so what we're doing is really computed style uh, from the document, and then grabbing the pixel size CSS variable but that's going to come back with a uh, as a string, like one px all in a string, um, and that what we need is a nice clean value that we can multiply by. And so I just wrapped all that in a parse int, and that'll give us back like one or two, whatever the integer is. Next we have this held directions, and that I specifically like to use arrays for that because uh, a lot of kind of first stabs at this kind of thing, people will say like, well, if left is held, then go left. If right is held, go right. But sometimes a player is holding both left and right down. And so the game code will go like left and then immediately cancel it out with going right. And so I like to keep track of which arrows are being held in a array format that keeps track of the order that they were added in. So that way you can like hold down left and then add in right and then release right while still holding down left and then the game will know left, right, left without getting confused. And so um, array works really well for that. And so we're just gonna pull the first from the array. We'll see where that's added in a second. And then we just kind of have our repetitive logic. It's like if, if the direction you're holding, because we're only gonna accept one, that first one in the array, if it's right, add the speed. If it's left, subtract the speed. Um, you know, adding will be increasing the number. We're going to use that in a CSS rule in a few lines here. Um, same as like top and left in CSS. Go to higher number, you're going to go towards the right. Higher number in the vertical axis, you'll go towards the bottom. And so we see that here with directions down. If you're holding down, you go down. If you're holding up, you go up. And then just a little state thing to wire into our character animations. If you're in this block here where you have a held direction, um, it's possible the character's not holding anything down right now, and so there were, there is no held direction. Um, if, if there is a held direction, we're going to go ahead and set facing, which is an attribute on the div, to be whatever the held direction is, and that will tap into some CSS. Along those lines, right after this block, we're going to set a different attribute called walking, and that uh, will either be true or false based on if there is a held direction. And so walking will tell us to actually play the animation the first one is just which direction they're facing, which are kind of two different things in the sprite sheet. Finally, we're going to pipe these new x, y rules. Uh, if you remember, at the very top, we initialized them at 0. But now we're listening to keyboard input. Or rather, when this function calls, we'll update those values with what is in the keyboard input. We'll add the bindings in a little bit. Um, we're just going to pipe all that into a transform translate 3D rule, which is kind of the best choice for applying a uh, positional style to something, but without asking the browser to repaint it every time, because this function is going to be firing once on every frame. We want to make that as easy as possible on the browser. And so the, the kind of performant way to do that is to use this rule with 3D on it. But we don't care about the third at the third one, the Z. All we care about is taking our X, multiplying it by the pixel size, which again, that's important because if you're at a pixel size of four, and you're only adding one every time, then your character's going to like crawl and have a sub-pixel thing going on. Uh, and same with the y. Multiply by y, just always passing in zero for the z. And then we have um, everything surrounded in back ticks here. Now it's time to actually use the function that we have up here. It's doing all this stuff. And so what we have is a step. And there's uh, this concept called a game loop where um, 
all the engines call them something a little bit different, but the game loop is basically like one thing that happens on every frame. And there can often end up being a lot of stuff in there. But basically what we're going to do is set up a step function, which is the function that's going to happen on every frame. Inside that, we're going to run our place character, which is the function we just step or walk through. Uh, and then after step is done, we're going to use the browser feature request animation frame to smartly refire another step whenever the browser is ready. And so um, that should be roughly 60 frames per second. So this is setting up the function. This one is firing it off for the first time. When it's done firing, it will fire itself again and just keep going, keep going, keep going. Next, let's get into our directions. And my bad, we actually have already used them up here. We have uh, in our logic, we have directions.right, directions.left. You might be asking, where do those come from? Well, they came from down here. Uh, what I've done is set up kind of a makeshift enum, which maps a key to a value. So anywhere in the code that we're talking about a concept of left, left the direction, instead of hard coding like a string left every time, it could be error prone in some cases, or it's just kind of redundant. Uh, what I've done is created a directions enum that has keys on it. So anywhere in the code, we'll say directions.left. Um, and then same with keys, right? So the, these keys over here map to, <laughs> they're, they're in a wrong order, um, which might be confusing. But uh, basically, when we are going to start doing keyboard events down here, each time you press a key, it's going to come back with which key you pressed. Those for the arrow keys just happen to be 38, 37, 39, 40, basically uh, 37 through 40. Uh, and they're in this order. And so uh, the code, when you press key 38, it's going to know that that is the up key. So you could actually rebind these two. If you wanted to add like uh, WASD support or remappable controls for your player, you could do that in this way. OK, and then finally, let's get to the key binding. So document, add event listener, anytime you touch a key, what we're going to do is check for the key, uh, kind of like what I just explained before. And if this key exists in our directions array, or our directions object, which is up here, we are going to accept it as a value. And then we're going to look at our held directions and determine if we've already got it in there or not. And so to do that, we're going to check for the index of this value, which will be like up or down um, is negative one. So if it doesn't find it in the array, that will be negative one. If that's the case, then we can go ahead and push it into the array, but not push because push will add it to the back to naturally give us that um, order of which one is first in the list. We're going to use unshift, which is going to add it to the front of the array. Uh, so if we always want to know like what was the last key that came in, we just check the zeroth entry in, into the array. And then pretty much opposite of that, in our key up event, so when you release the key, we're going to, again, look up the direction and then figure out if it's in the array. This time, opposite, if it is in the array, its index should be greater than negative 1. It'll be like 0, 1, 2, or 3. And then what we can do is just naturally use the array method splice to, at that index point, remove one item, which would be the one that you just released. Now let's actually see where we're at. Um, so this whole time I've been talking through the code, now I'm going to start interacting with it. So if I hold down the arrow keys, see that I've temporarily taken out the camera following that we saw in the intro, and I'm going to slowly in reintroduce that now. Uh, so when I hold down the arrow keys, the character moves, but there's no camera following happening. Let's see how we can do that now. So we'll go up to the code. If you remember in this place character function, we position the character itself. But what if we uh, what if we position the map also? So I'm going to come in here and copy basically the same thing. But this time, instead of applying it to the character, let's just call it to the map. If you remember at the very top, we grabbed a reference to the map. So that should um, set a style on the map container div. And like you see here, it looks the exact same as what we did because we copied it over from the character. So now when I move the character, see that um, it's moving and it's doing something right, but it's not quite right. Like it's no matter what I do, I kind of move my character away from the camera. And that's because we need to move the camera against where the character is going. And so to do that, we can just plop in a negative x and negative y. Uh, word wrapping here just so you see it. So negative x times pixel size, negative y times pixel size. Open it back up. And now I'm walking, and it's working right. 
see that the character's moving. We also we can barge through walls right now. Um, but the character is always in the top left corner, which makes it kind of hard to see what you're doing. Uh, but the thing I want to show you is just to reinforce the illusion of what's going on, because I think it's really trippy and interesting, is um, in this camera, we have that magic CSS rule we talked about before, overflow hidden, uh, unsung hero here. So if I just take this out, um, you and then you look at this way, and also let's do like a outline uh, one solid red to see the camera bounds. You can see it when I move. Now this like looks. This is the trippy thing I'm talking about, where like you see the map moving around, and you see the camera's not moving around. But because I can see the outsides of it, my brain just kind of perceives it differently. But as soon as I put this rule back in. We get the Game Boy thing going on, where the character can walk around, and because you can't see what's outside the red line, it's just like feels like it's the own little world that you're walking in. Let's fix the thing now where the character is always in the top left. We would rather the character be kind of centered in the middle of the frame. That'll make it easier to see where we're going, at least if we're going left or up. So to do that, we'll come back into where we applied our camera class or styles. Um, giving me some more code real estate here. And um, what I'm going to do is just kind of make a left and top value for the camera. And so instead of just using the character position, we're going to offset it by a little bit. Always using that pixel size. I'm just going to go with like 66 right now. These are values I eyeballed. You could divide the camera width in half. Uh, and then make sure you're including the size of the character in there too, like half the character size. But to me, I've, these felt pretty right on. Uh, and so we've got camera left and camera top. So what we're getting is just a new integer. And what we can do is simply add it to the offset that we're giving the map. So in here, we've got pixel size. We're going to say, or how about plus, thanks to our friend, the order of operations. Um, we've already factored our pixel size in. This will happen first, then we add the offset to it, and then we'll do the same for top on the y-axis here. Now you see, when I come back over here, that when I walk my character around, um, that offset is always kind of further, uh, far enough away from the character, it's working the same way, it's just kind of using a different point of reference so that the character is always seen in the middle. Okay, and that wraps up the concepts of a top-down game camera. Um, there's a lot in here that is pretty simplistic, but there's also a lot of room for expansion, where like some games have camera smoothing, where the camera maybe isn't always on top of the character all the time, maybe it like catches up to the character, or uh, camera look-aheads too, where if you're going really quickly in one direction. You might want the camera to sit ahead of where the character's going. Again, those are all concepts that I hope you can take these basics and kind of add on to it to achieve that sort of thing. We'll also look into more of those specific examples in future videos. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it. All the YouTube stuff, like, subscribe um, if you're into this kind of thing. I've got a bunch more videos planned, uh, camera stuff, battle stuff, all kinds of game development and HTML, CSS, and JavaScript stuff. So. Um, Hope to see you in future videos. I'll catch you later.